Today I'm going to be taking a look at the recently released Salix version 15.0. Salix is a Slackware based Linux distribution and I've never actually covered it on the channel before which kind of shocked me because I had assumed I've taken a look at Salix in the past but apparently I've never actually done so on camera. I've taken a look at Slackware and several Slackware based Linux distributions but for some reason Salix has slipped through the cracks. So we're gonna fix that problem today. I'm gonna take a quick first look and installation of Salix 15.0. I'm gonna be installing it inside a virtual machine. So let me switch over to this virtual machine here. And in the boot menu, you have a choice of various languages to select for the install process. I'm gonna choose English USA. And we come to a command prompt and you can see, you may type the word setup to start the installation. So let me type setup, all one word. All right, welcome to the installation of Salix, the Bonsai OS. Before you proceed with the rest of the installation, you might want to select your keyboard map, your key map. Your current key map is us.map, which is correct for me, so I don't need to change that. So I'll just hit enter here. Next, it says you may now proceed with the installation by pressing the enter key. If you want to exit the installation and drop to a Linux console, select exit installation. Of course, we want to continue, so I'm just going to hit enter here. Next up, we come to our partition editor, so we need to partition our drive. Now, they do have an important note here. It says if you are planning to use the ButterFS file system, well, Lilo, the default bootloader for Slackware and the Slackware-based distributions, will not be able to boot that, so in that case, you will need a separate slash boot partition with another file system. For me, I'm going to choose probably Extend 4 for the file system, so I should be okay here. So let's select a drive to actually do the partitioning on. Now, in this virtual machine, there's only one virtual hard drive. It's VDA, so I'm just going to go ahead and make sure my cursor is on VDA. And if I hit enter, it says there don't seem to be any Linux partitions on this machine. You'll have to make at least one of these to install Linux. Either select auto install from the menu or select install and use the partition editor to create. Okay. so. It gets us back to a, a previous screen about three screens ago. So once again, select install, select the drive. Maybe I needed to uh, space bar. Ah. I've got to put the cursor inside those parentheses. So once the cursor is there, hit the space bar on your keyboard to select it and then hit enter. And now it launches. This looks like CF disk. And from here, we can go ahead and create our partitions. In this virtual machine, I'm going to do a legacy BIOS installation because this particular virtual machine I'm using is not set up for EFI. So I'll choose a DOS partition table. And now I'm going to go ahead and create a new partition. It's going to ask the size. And just for sake of completeness, I will create a swap in this VM, even though I really don't need one. I'll create a one gig swap, so not a very big swap. So let's go ahead and create that. I'm going to go ahead and make that primary. And then let's go ahead and change the type. So I'm going to move the, the highlighted cursor over to type and it changed that from type 83, which is a Linux file system to type 82, which is a Linux swap. So that's very important because that's going to be the swap. And now free space here because we still have 24 gigs of free space. Let's go ahead and use the entire 24 gigs for another primary partition and this time it's type it defaults to Linux which is correct that's a Linux file system that's going to be my extend for file system so from there we are good I should be able to write now are you sure you want to write the partition table to the disk type the full word yes and hit enter it says the partition table has been altered now we can go ahead and quit out of the CF disk program and get back into here and from here you can see now I have slash dev slash VDA one so there is actually a partition on the drive and it has detected that it was type Linux swap so it knows that is supposed to be the swap so I'm just gonna hit OK now it's asking do I want to check the swap partition for bad blocks I'm gonna skip this typically this is not something you need to do if you want to you can but just for sake of time I'll skip that next is showing me the entry for slash dev slash VDA one how it's going to appear in the slash etsy slash FS tab file so that's your file system table configuration file uh, everything looks fine here 
here, so I'm just going to hit OK. Next, we need to do something with our big file system partition, which is slash dev slash VDA2, so I'm going to hit Enter on that. Next, it's going to ask about formatting it. Yes, we do need to format it, and of course, we need to choose a file system. It defaults to XFS, which is a fine file system. Typically, I use Extend4 file systems on my machine, so I'll just choose that and hit OK. Once again, it's going to show us the entry in the FS tab. Everything looks fine here, so I'm just going to click OK. Now next up, source media installation. So are we installing Salix from a USB stick or CD or DVD or you know some other method such as over a network? Now in this case, I have attached an ISO to this virtual machine, but I'm not sure how the virtual machine is going to recognize that. Is it going to see that as a USB stick plugged in? Or it might see it as a CD or DVD that's been attached. I'm going to assume it will probably see it as a CD or DVD, so I'm going to choose number two. And if that doesn't work, then I'll go back and, and try one of the other options. Make sure the Salix disk is in your CD DVD drive and then press enter. So let's go ahead and hit enter, scanning for CD DVD drive. And it does say a drive was found. Next, it says select the installation mode. So there's three different versions, I guess, to install. There's full, which installs everything, all the programs, right? Full graphical environment with a full suite of applications. Then you have a basic mode, which is installs a minimal graphical environment. So it does have XORG and it comes with a desktop environment probably, but not much else. And then you have a core installation, which is just the command line, right? You get a, a base install essentially of Salix, but you still don't have XORG or any kind of graphical environment at all. I'm going to choose the full installation. And away it goes. I'm not sure how long this will take. I'll pause the video. And that portion of the installation took about uh, four or five minutes to complete. Next up is installing the bootloader, which is Lilo. And it says, do we want to do the simple installation, which is installing it automatically, the expert installation, which is a setup menu using a config file. And then, of course, we could skip installing a bootloader, which is probably not a good option unless you have a real reason not to install a bootloader. But for me, I'm going to go ahead and choose the simple option. Next up, it says configure Lilo to use the frame buffer console it looks like it's setting the resolution size for the console or uh, basically our tty um, do we want it to be 640 by 480 which i think is the default that's really small it looks bad especially in these vms right i'm going to actually choose a slightly bigger console frame buffer so I'm going to do 1024 by 768. Next up, it says some systems might require extra parameters to be passed to the kernel. If you're one of these people that need to pass an extra parameter, you need to enter that here. For me, I'm OK. I'll leave this blank. So I'm going to hit OK. Next up, it says Lilo can be installed to a variety of places. So where do you want to put it? It looks like it's going to default to the master boot record. So I'm going to go with the default option in this case. And it's installing Lilo. Next, let's set the hardware clock. It is asking, uh, is your hardware clock set to coordinated universal time? If it is, select yes here. If the hardware clock is set to the current local time, and it, in parentheses it says, this is how most PCs are set up, then say no here. So I'm assuming I need to say no here. So I'm going to go with that. Next up, select your time zone configuration. So here you would need to know your time zone in relation to UTC. I actually am not sure what mine is. Are these the only options or should I do it the traditional way, which is going through the list? I typically do America slash Chicago. So I'm going to scroll up here, get past Asia and then into America. Let me find the C's. And there is America slash Chicago, which is in the central time zone in the U.S. I'm not actually in Chicago, but that is the correct time zone for me. So I'm going to click OK on that. Next, let's set the current locale, English US is my locale, and that's what it defaults to, so I'm just going to hit OK here. Next, it's asking about NumLock. Do you want to have the NumLock enabled or disabled on boot? Now, I actually don't have a NumLock key on my keyboard. I've got one of these uh, ErgoDoc Moonlander keyboards. I don't even have one of these keys mapped to NumLock, so I'm actually just going to disable it, because if it for some reason does enable numlock i have no way to disable it next it says you will now be presented with some dialogue so that you can create one or more user accounts so this is creating you know our user account and probably setting up our uh, sudo account as well so let's go ahead create a new account and the name for this account 
DT will be the username. And now we need to enter a strong and complicated password for the DT user. So DT, DT. It says that your password is too short, six characters minimum. Please try another one. I hate that. I hate it when they put these safety mechanisms because sometimes you're just trying things out, for example, in virtual machines, right, or, or just on test equipment. And I, I know they're doing this for security, but many people are just testing distributions out and having these kinds of minimum password links. I, I really find annoying, but... Uh, the password fails the dictionary check. It is too simplistic or systematic. I guess one, two, three, four, five, six. It doesn't like that as well. I'm just going to create something and I'll remember it for this recording, but I probably will never remember that password going forward. So it, it, it's probably going to be a situation where after I make this video, I'm going to have to delete this VM because I'll never remember the password for it. I, that's why I hate these password requirements sometimes. So we have a DT user, our home user, and do we need to create a new account advanced mode? No, modify account properties. Oh, well, let's see. This lists all the accounts on the system, uh, but really we only have one account we created, the DT account. If I go into properties, let's see. He is already a member of the wheel group, so we should have sudo privileges. That's really all I wanted to check. Everything else is fine. So let's go ahead and go back and back. And I think we're done here. So let me exit user setup. Next up is selecting the repository mirror. It says the country code of where the mirror is located is shown on the right. Your selection will be applied to some configuration files. I'm just going to go with the default here. It looks like slackware.uk slash salix. That's... It's in the UK. Surely they have something that is in the US. I better look through the list, see if I can find something closer to me. Yeah, there are a couple of US mirrors here. I'm going to choose the first one here. It says the Salix installation is complete. Reboot now. So let me go ahead and do that. So we're at a login manager. Now, I hope I can remember my truly strong and complicated password. I remembered it, so we're logged in. Let me go ahead and get a proper 1920 by 1080 screen resolution for this VM. So we open a terminal and zoom in. You guys have seen me run the XR and R command, XRander command, many times. It lists all the available monitor resolutions. Now, in a VM, some of this will depend on the video driver. For me, I typically use the uh, Vert IO drivers, video drivers in my virtual machines, and Vert IO does have a proper 1920 by 1080 screen resolution available. So now let me run the XRander command, XRander space dash S space, and then give it one of the available screen resolutions, such as 1920 by 1080. And now this virtual machine should hopefully remember that we want a 1920 by 1080 screen resolution. Now, every time I come back to this VM. Now, first things first, aesthetics. I really like the look and feel of this desktop environment. I've only been in it just a few seconds, and it has a really classy, kind of classic feel to it uh, as far as you know a light gtk theme the menu system looks good i like the icon set with these blue icons they're kind of uh, flat in color it's really again it's a a classic kind of feeling desktop environment it's not trying to to do anything out of the ordinary and i kind of like that let's go ahead and see what is installed out of the box in salix now remember i did the full installation so we should have a full suite of applications available to us so let's go category by category. If I go into accessories, we have our application finder. We have the bulk rename tool, catfish file search, you know, standard XFCE utilities, the character map, the clipboard manager. Now the clipboard manager, is it already enabled or do I have to launch it? Yeah. When I hit enter, now I have a clipboard down here in the system tray. So let's see which clipboard they are using. If I go to about, that is Clipman, probably the most common uh, clipboard manager that you see on Linux these days. If I go back into accessories, we have mGrandpa. That's an archive manager. That's standard uh, XFCE archiving tool. So that's for zip and unzip, you know, extracting things like tar and things like that. Getting back into the accessories category, 
We have Galculator, which is one of my favorite GTK base calculators. It's very simple as far as, you know, in this basic mode, it's just a standard calculator, but you've got all of your scientific modes and paper modes and things like that. Really nice little simple calculator that doesn't have a ton of dependencies or anything. So that's the calculator that I typically install on my systems. Also under accessories, we have LeafPad, which is a plain text editor. LeafPad was the plain text editor for the old LXDE desktop environment that is now dead. I'm kind of surprised they went with LeafPad here because XFCE has its own plain text editor called MousePad. But I guess they decided to go with LeafPad instead. Then we have Notes. I'm not sure what this is. Obviously, it's a note-taking app, but I'm not sure what the program is. If I go to about notes 1.9.0, so it's actually named simply notes and it is an XFCE application. And it looks like when I close the program out, uh, there is something sitting in the sys tray. Yeah, so I can, ah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, pretty neat. I, I never use any of these note taking applications on Linux, but I know many people find them useful. And uh, that looks like a, a very easy and simple application to use. Then we have our screenshot utility, our task manager. Thunar, of course, is the file manager, the default file manager for the XFC desktop environment. If I go to about, this is Thunar 4.16.0. Getting back into the menu, let's go to the development category. The development category has a much better text editor than LeafPad, and this is Genie. Genie is really an IDE, but it's a plain text editor as well, and it's a fantastic uh, plain text editor. I've actually done a couple of videos in the past on Genie. It's one of the text editors that I've used primarily as my text editor of choice in years past before I discovered things like Vim and Emacs, but still, I, I can use Genie. Genie actually has a pretty okay Vim mode to it. It's not a great Vim mode. Uh, it's not like evil mode in Emacs, but the Vim mode in Genie is passable. Also under development, you had meld. Meld is a way to compare two different files. You can think of it as a uh, diff application. So if I open it, it's going to ask for two different files and it's going to compare them line by line and give you the diff, right? You know, how they differ. Under the graphics category, we have GIMP, which is our free and open source image editor. You can think of it as a free and open source alternative to something like Adobe Photoshop. GIMP is actually what I use to create all the artwork on my channel. It's what I use to create all the thumbnails for my channel. Uh, GIMP is a truly fantastic piece of free and open source software. Also under graphics, we have our image viewer, which is Ristretto. Under internet, we have Firefox as our web browser. Let's see what version we're on. And let's go ahead and make Firefox full screen here and let's open the menu, go to help and go to about Firefox. This is Firefox 102.2.0 ESR. So this is the extended support release version of Firefox. That's what the ESR on it means. Firefox, of course, uh, the free open source browser of choice for many millions of people around the world. And matter of fact, when Firefox first exploded on the scene about 20 years ago, for a while, Firefox was actually the most uh, used browser on the planet as far as market share. It was the biggest browser until, of course, Google Chrome exploded on the scene and kind of took over the browser market share. But still, Firefox is still around and it's still typically the default browser on most Linux operating systems. Also under internet, we have ClauseMail for an email client. Most people don't have a need for a desktop email client these days. And honestly, ClauseMail is not really great. Nobody really uses it. It's, it's a, if you're going to install Mozilla Firefox for your browser, you should probably install Mozilla Thunderbird for your email client. There's just no reason to go with some weird alternative like Claws Mail. That's just my opinion, but I think most Linux desktop users would probably prefer a full featured email client like Thunderbird to some of the cheaper alternatives. And then you have Pigeon for an instant messaging client. Nobody really does IM anymore, so you could probably just not even bother with that, <laughs> putting that on the ISO anymore. Transmission is your BitTorrent client. And uh, if you hit agree, you know, you go find some some BitTorrents on the internet. Many Linux distributions, the way they, uh, the way you grab their ISOs typically is through BitTorrent just because it saves on bandwidth. Typically, many distributions, you can either download their ISOs from their web servers, but remember, you're using their servers, their bandwidth. It's better if they offer a torrent download, go grab your Linux ISOs through torrenting. That's, that's just a lot easier on those distributions. Under the 
the multimedia category, we have a CD ripper called Asunder. I've actually used Asunder many, many years ago these days. Nobody really uses music CDs. Nobody has a need for music ripping. So Excel is our music player. Now, I don't know too much about Excel. I've launched it a few times in VMs, but I've never actually used it as my primary audio player. But if You've seen one audio player, you've seen them all, right? They all, as long, as long as they play your music, you're okay, right? And then you have install multimedia codecs. So that's probably something as a desktop user you're gonna wanna do. And it, of, of course you have to have sudo privileges to install software. So let's go ahead and enter my sudo password. Install multimedia codecs and I'm gonna click next. So this gives us all the multimedia codecs we need to play all formats of music and video, you know, your DVDs and Blu-rays and things like that, because most of that stuff is proprietary software. Most of it is stuff that I guess the distribution doesn't want to ship installed out of the box. They kind of make you install it, although they give you a very easy way. Here's a link. Click on this, hit a password, right? For legal reasons, they don't want to take that responsibility and install it out of the box for you. Anyway, here is a list of everything that will be installed. I'm gonna click install, and I don't know how long these installations will take. I'll wait a couple of minutes here for this to complete. And it says, codex installation was completed. Would you like to remove the codec installer from your system? Well, now that they're installed, yeah, I don't need that link to install them still on the system. So let's go ahead and remove it. And now if I go back into the multimedia category, yeah, that's no longer an option. We have Parole Media Player. This will be, of course, your video player. Also under multimedia, we have the Pulse Audio Volume Control, and we have XF Burn. XF Burn is a, a CD DVD burner. It is one of the standard apps in the XFCE suite of software. Let me close that out. There is an Office category and it does contain the entire LibreOffice suite. We also have Atrial as our document viewer. That'll be a PDF viewer is what that is. And then of course a Settings category and a Systems category. This will have a lot of your standard XFCE settings stuff. Uh, we don't need to take a look at that. We have our XFCE terminal. If I go back into the uh, Favorites category here, They've got some applications already pinned for us because they assume these will be the most common things a user will look for. The browser, the email client, the file manager, the terminal, and our package manager, which is G-Slapped. So let me go ahead and click on that and enter my uh, sudo password, my strong and complicated sudo password. And it says permission denied because I don't remember. I knew this would happen. I <laughs> can't remember the password. I think that one was it. Yeah, all right. And now we get into G-Slapped. And G-Slapped is a, a graphical package manager, right? It's very reminiscent to like the Synaptic package manager. For those of you that have used Debian or Debian-based distributions, Synaptic package manager has this similar kind of like two or three pane layout where you go and you can just tick on applications to install or you can do a search. For example, is HTOP installed? Let me search for HTOP. And you can see the blue box here, meaning HTOP is already installed, so I don't need to install it, although I could mark it, I think, for uninstall. Yeah, I, I could mark it for removal, but I like HTOP. So that is how G-Slapped would work. Now let me go ahead and open the terminal. I wonder if Control-Alt-T opens a terminal. It does. Very nice Salix, guys. I like uh, having standard key binding, so I always know how to get to a terminal when I need it. Since HTOP is installed, let's check on system resource usage. Now, there are a couple of programs that are running that weren't running on a cold boot. Remember the SysTray. It still has our note application, so let me go ahead and remove that. We also have our uh, clipboard manager. Let me go ahead and quit out of that. And that does uh, reduce the RAM usage. Actually, not by much, maybe 10, 15 megs of RAM, but 437 megs of RAM of the six gigs of RAM that I gave this VM. So very lightweight, right? And almost no CPU usage going on right now, which you would expect. We're not doing anything that requires CPU at the moment. So that is the beauty of XFCE. It's a very lightweight desktop environment. It's really good for older or underpowered machines. Let's go ahead and see what version of the kernel we are on. So if I do a U name space dash R, we're using kernel version 5.15.63. One thing I want to check is Slackware, I know, does not use SystemD. It uses uh, an older fork of the old SysV init. I'm not sure about Salix. 
because it does obviously differ from mother Slackware. So I'm going to do a where is system D just to see if system D is installed. Where's the binaries and libraries? And yes, you can see there is system D. There is user lib system D and user lib 64 system D. So it, apparently they are using system D. So if I do a system uh, CTL status and it says uh, system CTL command not found. So they may not be actually using uh, system D. Yeah. So apparently they have some components of system D installed, probably for compatibility reasons with certain pieces of software that have some dependencies on some components of system D, but they're still using the, uh, the standard init system that Slackware uses. So if I did a where is init, eh, there's the binary for init, but that doesn't really give me much information either on that. Let me go ahead and clear the screen. Let's go ahead and exit out of the terminal. Let me go ahead and right click on the desktop and I'm going to go to desktop settings and let's go ahead and check out the wallpaper. So let's see what kind of wallpaper pack this ships with. And yeah, I like that. It's very plain as far as minimal, as far as like a blue gradient going on with the Salix logo. And then of course we have some penguins as well. Uh, some more duck-like penguins actually in that one. Some more Salix branded wallpapers. Actually, these are really good. I actually really love these wallpapers that they're shipping with. Uh, here is a map of the world <laughs> that is in the shape of some penguins as well. Yeah, these were really, really nice. Yeah, these are not bad. I like the purple. <laughs> yeah, I think I could get down with that. So that is Salix 15.0. Just a very quick cursory look at the recently released Salix 15.0 with the XFCE desktop environment. XFCE. If you've seen it once, you've seen it a thousand times. XFCE really doesn't see. Uh, fast development. It never really has major changes. And that's why a lot of people like it. It's always got that familiar kind of look and feel, that familiar workflow, that almost Windows 7 like workflow that so many of us probably are, are comfortable with. Overall, I think Salix is a great Slackware based distribution with an installation that's not very difficult, just a standard incurses installer, but it's a, not a hard installer to use. Anybody should be able to get through an installation of Salix. And once it's installed, you've got a full suite of software, you've got a graphical package manager, you've got everything you need as far as using Linux as a daily driver on the desktop. Now before I go, I need to thank a few special people. I need to thank the producers of this episode. And of course, I'm talking about Dustin Gabe, James, Matt, Maxim, Mimit, Michael, Mitchell, Paul, Wes, Wyatt, Bald, Homie, Alex, Allen, Armor, Dragon, Chuck, Commander, Angry, Diokai, Dylan, Greg, Marstrom, Erion, Alexander, Paul, Peace, Arch, and Vador, Polytech, Realities for Less, Red Prophet, Steven, Tools, Devler, and Willie. These guys, they are my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. They are the producers of this episode. The show is also brought to you by each and every one of these fine ladies and gentlemen as well. All these names you're seeing on the screen right now. These are all my supporters over on Patreon because I don't have any corporate sponsors. I'm sponsored by you guys, the community. If you like my work and want to see more videos about Linux and free and open source software, subscribe to DistroTube over on Patreon. All right, guys. Peace.